Apex Express, Asian Pacific Expression. Community and cultural coverage, music and calendar, new visions and voices. Coming to you with an Asian Pacific Islander point of view. It's time to get on board the Apex Express. Welcome to Apex Express, news and views with an Asian and Asian American point of view. Tonight, we bring you powerful words from Kearney Street Workshop's talented teachers and students of this year's Interdisciplinary Writers Lab. IWL is a three-month, multi-genre class for local writers challenged to expand their practice by working in a variety of genres and formats. Stay tuned to hear the fruits of their labor. I'm your host, No No Girl. Keep it locked right here on Apex Express. But first, we want to recalibrate a discussion on immigration after the terrorist attack in Paris. With us, we have Professor Bill Ong Hing, Dean Circle Scholar at the USF School of Law. He's the founder of the Immigrant Legal Resource Center in San Francisco and was a consulting scholar on Crossing East, the Peabody Awarded Radio Documentary Series on Asian Immigration to the U.S. We've had you on before on Apex Express last month, and we were talking about the Syrian refugee crisis. One of the things that we didn't get a chance to talk to you about is... um, We were looking at the role that the United States is playing in receiving refugees, and it's been a very slow process. And part of that is because of the extreme screening process that goes through before we allow refugees in. So given that there's all this kind of fear mongering of folks saying we don't want to let Syrians in, they're the ones who are going to, you know, do terrorist acts. um, Can you just describe to us what that screening process is? The screening process to become a refugee is almost more extreme than normal immigration because after September 11th, we actually do fear that terrorists might come into the United States. That experience and the experience actually after World War II where we mistakenly allowed in some Nazi war criminals that have ended up being fared it out and discriminate and de- deported. Um, we take extra precaution when it comes to refugees. So what it involves is first there's a number that is designated. How many people can apply for a certain per- region of the world. So for this fiscal year, President Obama said we're going to allow in 10,000 Syrian refugees. Those refugees somehow have to make it to an American embassy to apply. They can they fill out a form either online or in hard copy. They fill out the application. They have to explain why they fear persecution. That application is reviewed once by the people at these American embassies. Then, from the Department of Homeland Security, there's a team of refugee evaluators. That team travels all over the world to look at refugee applications, and then they interview the refugees. They test them by asking them about their families, their backgrounds, where they went to school, what their beliefs are, et cetera, et cetera. And so they're very intensive interviews. And the whole purpose for that is to look for whether or not there's some indication that the person may not be who they say they are or that they're lying. And of course, Part of all that is fingerprinting, names and fingerprints are run through Interpol, um, the, uh, and, and I even forgot one other level of screening. Before they even get to apply at the American Embassy, they are screened by the United Nations High Commissioner's Office for Refugees. And so the, the UNHCR, they make a recommendation that this person should be be able to apply. So there's multiple levels of screening and the process can take anywhere from a minimum, I would say, of nine to 10 months to maybe 18 months before somebody would be able to come in as a refugee. 
Well, since the Paris attack, there's been all of these elected officials um, having a knee-jerk reaction, just like saying, no, we don't want any refugees in our state. So can you kind of parse that out? And we were talking about, you know, whether that's legal or not, and also kind of the political implications of what they're doing. Right. Well, first of all, no governor can keep out of their state a lawful immigrant or lawful refugee. Uh, Anyone who is admitted lawfully into the United States has the right to travel. There's only one entity that can regulate immigration. That's the federal government. That's in the Constitution, and that's a separation of powers concept, that when it comes to immigration, only the federal government can regulate immigration. And so, for example, when Arizona a few years ago passed its anti-immigration law, SB 1070, the Supreme Court struck down the bulk of it on the grounds that Arizona was trying to regulate immigrants because they were trying to pass special laws that made it a crime to be illegal in their state. And the Supreme Court said, no, you can't do that. That's regulating immigrants. So the governors cannot keep anyone out. Now, here's another challenge, though. Even though they can't keep someone from coming into their borders, there is this question of refugee resettlement money because the federal government provides refugee resettlement funds that usually are distributed to the state and then the state gives it to various refugee resettlement programs. There are different um, Catholic Charities programs, there's International Refugee Committee, there's, there's a variety of entities that are known to help People get resettled, job training, language training, social uh, Americanization, if you will, uh, integration programs. Uh, and the governors are, are threatening that they won't distribute that money to the agencies that are going to help Syrian refugees. And that, again, that's the state cannot discriminate based on ethnicity. It would be trying to, for example, discriminating and saying that Chinese can't get something, but that Latinos could. You, you can't do that kind of discrimination in the United States anymore. Now, the danger, of course, is that beyond the law, beyond uh, what they can or cannot do, it is a question of whether or not the governors can create an unwelcoming atmosphere. And that's a different question because if people in Texas are going to hate the Syrians, well, you may not want to place them there. Unfortunately, I think that when a governor of a state makes statements against the Syrians, it creates an atmosphere and fear mongering and other people chime in and they feel deputized by the governor to themselves engage in private vigilante type of racism. And, uh, and so that's a problem that's, it's, that's not a legal problem. That, that's a social problem that these governors might be creating. Mm. Well, I've seen a lot of historical context to other time periods where the U.S. has turned away refugees. And, you know, a 2020 hindsight, we see the mistakes that we've made. Can you talk about some of those examples? We talked about um, Eastern European Jews. We also talked about Southeast Asians. Right. From since uh, in the night since the 19th. In the 1920s, there was something called a national origins quota system that was how people got into the United States. And there's these quotas that favored Western Europeans. So when the war started, the Second World War started in Europe, many Jews were trying to flee because of what Hitler was doing, even though it wasn't as well known as we know today what was going on. But Jews fled, and there's this very infamous incident involving a ship called the SS St. Louis, where it carried uh, hundreds of Jews who were trying to get into the United States and get protection. But Franklin Roosevelt turn that ship around for fear that it would send the wrong message. If he, if he accepted that ship, then more would come. And that ship went, was sent back to Europe. And the fate of those Jews has, is well documented that most of them died in the Holocaust. And, and so that's one sad chapter. And, and you're right. When, when the, 
The United States withdrew from Vietnam in April 1975. What the United States contemplated was that there would be perhaps a few thousand uh, Vietnamese and a, a handful of other Southeast Asians that might qualify as refugees who had been helping the military. But when it became very clear that those individuals had families and there was a bigger crisis, we opened it up more and we allowed in thousands more and and then U.S. military personnel argued with the administration that we, for example, also had to allow in Hmong of, in Laos who were helping us fight this this silent CIA war on our behalf against the, the Laotian communists and, and once we withdrew the Laotians were persecuting the Hmong and so we allowed in more Hmong into the United States so we've made some very serious mistakes States. We did the same thing in the 1980s uh, with respect to Central America when we were turning away Guatemalans and El Salvadorans because the governments were governments that the United States supported. But then when the persecution became very clear and congressional hearings demonstrated that the governments that we were propping up were actually persecuting the people that were fleeing, we acknowledged the mistake and we actually ended up allowing more Guatemalans and El Salvadorans in at that time. So we chronically have made mistakes when it comes to refugees. And if we listen to these 31 or so um, Republican governors who are trying to turn away Syrian refugees, I think we would make another serious mistake. I don't know if I can. Feeling words of creative writing. Kearney Street Workshop is the nation's oldest multidisciplinary Asian American arts organization. In addition to creating a space for emerging artists to test out their material and build an audience, KSW fosters a safe space for established writers to push their boundaries. It's called the Interdisciplinary Writers Lab, and this year, 15 students were selected to work with three award-winning teachers. Bryn Saito for poetry, Naomi Munawira for fiction, and Tanaka Hodge for writing for performance. To celebrate the release of the 2015 IWL anthology, a packed room gathered at the California Institute of Integral Studies to hear the fruits of their labor. Tonight, you'll hear from the students and teachers. The works they perform span poetry, fiction, and essay writing. Jason Bayani, a gifted writer by his own right and KSW program manager, served as the night's MC. And our first cohort reader of the night is Shelley Wong. Give it for Shelley Wong. I crossed the Pacific. Water swirled inside me, threatening to drown me out. I came for gold, for, ver- for railroad iron, for hope, for family, for love. The city was steep. I found my brothers and sisters in Chinatown. I ran through the ocean to the rivers threading through the mountains. I lit the fuse that split the mountain like a melon. I struck the iron. The iron struck back. I was an iron river without gold running out. I bled into the ocean, the mountain, my red that ran the span of the continent. When the work was done, the ghosts put up the iron against us to drain our lineage. But four families found each other in the steep city, and I changed the land, the land that shuddered and shook, bringing fire that devoured our houses, but also the city hall records. Then my river became an iron bridge, my paper suns crossing over, and I branched and branched, red, red, and red, pouring over new bones and old names. I was the heartbeat fire that spread into the earth, soaking into the old trees. I was the burning blood. So next up, please give a warm welcome to Celeste Chen. Hello. Oh, it's, it's beautiful to look out and see you all. I've actually just been traveling for 24 hours, 10 a.m. yesterday to 10 a.m. this morning. And that seems appropriate for this story. <laughs> Wolf pack in the tenderloin at midnight. They walk up Hyde Street. Wrappers litter the ground, wet with rain. 
Hey, sweetheart, comes a low, gravelly whisper from a car to the left. The four women keep walking past the locked children's playground, the gangway, the New Century Theater with its promise of sparkling lights and dancing women, and then past rows of closed shops that look like dank confession booths. They stumble into line at Grub Steak, waiting on the sidewalk until they are called in. API and queer, butch and femme, and in between. Hong Kong immigrant and Filipina mestiza, Bangladeshi and Chinese Malaysian. They swill beer and swish their legs, clad in a swirl of black jeans and denim jackets, magenta velvet dress, teal rhinestones, and a crusty polyester gown. Finally, they're eating. They talk over turkey dinner and mashed potatoes. It is Pride Month in the city, this place of queer mythology. A buttery smell wafts from the kitchen, onions curling up like sweet question marks, sausages frying in a pan, flames fanning out blue halos. And then they are done. Outside grub steak, there is a glint of broken glass lying silver in the ground. Brush against a beefy arm. Beer breath. Tense arm gripping a corona. She sees the man's tight jaw. His head, a giant pink cabbage patch doll. Pursed lips atop a beefy body. He reaches past her, puts a gleaming bottle between her butch friend's legs. Are you a man or a woman? He says laughs. His two faceless friends laugh next to him. Her friend doesn't flinch, grabs the bottle tightly, holds it if she needs a weapon. He looks. She and her friends stand unmoving in the doorway of grub steak. She takes off her high heel, readies it with her hand. She remembers reading somewhere that you could pierce a human heart with a heel. Used with force, the spike stiletto could cut through flesh, through muscle. So, she gets ready. Cabbage Patch moves first. Pushes past them. Go back to Concord, her friend yells. They are luckier than the New Jersey Four. Cabbage Patch and friends are a beige blur. Pushing past the women and into the restaurant. She needs to be in motion, pulls her friends with her to embrace the tenderloin streets at midnight. Drunken heart, crushed, for what almost happened, for what didn't happen. They are morphing, from female to feral, swallowing the night sky, deviant and defiant. Thank you. So if, you, you know, if, you, uh, if you're not familiar with Interdisciplinary Writers Lab, Interdisciplinary Writers Lab is a three-month program. Uh, once a week, they uh, meet, uh, and it consists of three different genres. We have uh, you know poetry, fiction, performance, and uh, you know we had a uh, section for poetry and fiction and writing for performance. And throughout the whole three months. The entire cohort worked together through these three different genres. And so a lot of them got to really experiment and break out of their comfort zones. And uh, it's pretty awesome to see. So uh, next up to the mic, please welcome up Audrey. Give up for Audrey. I wrote this poem as my first attempt at eco-poetry. Our poetry teacher, Bryn Sato. She told us she was writing a poem from the perspective of a river that was recently undammed so that its waters could bring life back to the surrounding ecosystem. And it made me think what freedom, what liberation song that river must be singing. And then what is the opposite of that liberation? What would an echo poem be like from that opposite perspective? So this is called Great Dismal Speaks to Nat Turner. I'm saturated sponge of land soaking up all where the waters seep. I'm lazy lift of alligator eyelid, slow to rouse from dark, dank sleep. I'm drawn out sound of lily pad protests as fat bullfrogs 
slowly leap. I'm crunch of leaf, snap of twig, under feet that never rush, always creep. I'm stretched wide from the Cape Fear River up north to Chesapeake. I spill over with drowned sorrows. Death visits my depths only to reap. Everything, everyone comes here to hide. I store the memories way down deep. And you, why do you draw near to me? What secrets do you need me to keep? Thank you. You're listening to Apex Express on KPFA 94.1 FM, kpfa.org online. And this is a recording of the final reading of Kearney Street Workshop's Interdisciplinary Writers Lab, a multi-genre masterclass for local writers. Our next read instructor that I'm going to bring up is Naomi Munawira. Let me say a couple of things about Naomi. Um, Naomi is a Sri Lankan American author and artist. Her debut novel, Island of a Thousand Mirrors, was initially published in South Asia and was released in the U.S. in fall by St. Martin's Press. The novel has received rave reviews from sources as diverse as Mother Jones and Hyphen Magazine. It was long listed for the Man Asia Literary Prize, making it one of the 15 best books coming out of Asia in 2012. It was shortlisted for the DSC Prize for South Asian Literature and won the Commonwealth Regional Prize for Asia. Uh, she's a graduate of the is a graduate of the IWL program. So she went from being a graduate to teaching the IWL program uh, and has a new book forthcoming in February 2016, What Lies Between Us, published by St. Martin's Press. You know, usually you teach these things and it's an exercise in intellectualism or it's an exercise in like teaching writing. And this one was completely different because it's writers of color And I feel like we went on some kind of journey together. And the piece that I'm going to read is really, it's dedicated to all of you guys that were in my, all of you, all 15 of you who like totally touched me. And I also want to say that like I'm a fiction writer, but this is nonfiction, which I never, never do. So, you know, it's pushed my boundaries a little bit too. Um, the other part of this is I think like in the process of these three months, like race became so in your face. It was like impossible to ignore. The first day I walked into class to teach was the day that the Charleston shooting happened. So that's what this is about. The final day I taught, I witnessed a uh, police shooting in Oakland and then came in and taught that night. Um, so it has just been like in your face. And I think that as a cohort, as instructors, we were sort of processing this stuff together. What does it mean to be a person of color in this country today? It's painful. And what is the response? And my responses are it's writing, it's teaching. And um, so that's what this piece is about. It was um, published in the Huffington Post. Writing race the day after Charleston. On Thursday evening, I walked into a writing class I was teaching for the first time. Fifteen eloquent writers of color were gathered together and waiting for me. I wondered what I could possibly teach them at this particular moment when I felt broken myself. What could I say to them about books and writing that had any import in the face of what had happened the night before? The night before, a 21-year-old white man sat in community with worshipers for an hour before he slaughtered them. He said to them, you're taking over our country. A statement that reveals profound and brutal denial of how their ancestors came to this land. He said, you rape our women. And then he proceeded to shoot six women along with three men. When I brought up Charleston, my students looked down at their desks, at their pens and papers, anywhere but at me or at each other. There was a muteness shrouding the room, a welling sadness. We were gathered together, a collection of artists on the front lines of a national conversation on race, and yet we were speechless. We were silenced by the contradictions. This moment in history, when we have a black president, a scenario most of our parents could not have imagined, and at the same time, once again, we are painfully reminded that we are a country founded upon slavery and genocide. 
I asked them what they had read growing up and got the usual list of dead white men and a few dead white women. Like myself, these are writers who did not grow up seeing themselves or their communities reflected in the lauded literature of the land. These are writers who, are, who have only a few generations of mentors echoing their experience. These are writers challenging the normative white literary experience. I asked them why they write. That was when the heat rose and the room became alive. For an impassioned hour and a half, we talked about storytelling and its importance, about why we continue to write in the face of opposition, both from a mainstream audience that often overlooks our stories, as well from our own communities that sometimes feel that we are exposing secrets or that our stories are not important. A woman talked about writing about the experience of her family in the segregated South. She had written a story about her grandmother walking down the street and being told to step aside for whites. She told of reading that story to an audience and having an older woman say to her, why are you telling these stories? It happened to all of us. It's not important. I didn't have an answer, but I didn't need one. Her peers jumped in. No, they argued, these stories are important. A young woman said, we have to tell these stories. We have to tell them and tell them and tell them until they are as ubiquitous as the narratives of the dominant culture we live within, until we see their importance, until they see our humanity. Over and over, these students articulated, articulated writing as about the sanity, connection, a font of resistance, the violence happening to bodies and psyches. A young man said, writing is one of the only ways I know how to articulate my survival while being in conversation with others trying to do the same. Survival, that's the word that stands up and screams. This storytelling is about survival. Survival on the streets and the survival of culture, survival in a country where, as John Stewart, one unlikely voice of America's conscience states that there is a gaping racial wound which will not heal, which we pretend does not exist. This was before Wyatt Sinek, so excuse that. But these students, these writers, they won't pretend this wound doesn't exist. They will join the ranks of Audre Lorde and James Baldwin and the others that have come before them. They will tell their stories. They won't ignore the wound because it is woven into the fabric of their lives. They will write it. They will tell it. This is what my students will be doing. This is what I will be doing. At some point, someone said, I love everyone in this room. There were smiles through the heaviness. I thought, here is our community. Here is the only solace and salve I can imagine in this moment. Next week, Bona Voices, the only ongoing Writers of Color conference in this country, commences in Miami. Two of my students will be heading there to continue this conversation in a larger community, a larger gathering. Being a Bona alum myself, I know how much power and healing there is in gathering. The stories will flow. They will flood the page. They will enter the ethos. They will change the narrative. They will remind us of James Baldwin's words. The precise role of the artist is, after all, to make the world a more human dwelling place. Thursday night, in the midst of tremendous heaviness, those bright students gave me something I wasn't expecting. They gave me hope. In the scope of what is happening in America today, hope is as noble a reason for writing as I can think of. Thank you. We were talking earlier, and um, when you're a writer of color, you know, sometimes, you know, you feel like, you know, all, all I really want to do is just be an artist, you know. But the thing is, you know, if, you're not, if you are an artist of color, things like... You never get to just be an artist. Things like, oh, you have to face things like oppression, you know, constantly, whether as much as you want to try to escape it. As an artist, it is going to be there. And um, to have spaces like this for, for artists of color can be very necessary uh, to be able to work through these things, to be able to have a space that is safer 
uh, to work through these things. Um, because we're always having to constantly deal with being in spaces that are not centered around us. But to have a space that is time and time again proves to be so necessary. And I think, you know, for my own development as artists, it is what has kept me in. And, uh, you know, we are hoping to keep this program alive, you know, for that very reason. And, and for a lot of the programs we do over here at KSW, uh, because it is necessary. It's why this organization started, uh, to have our own space to make things. And, uh, you know, we hope to continue, continue keep, keep, uh, keeping alive. Next up, uh, <clears throat> bring up the next reader. <clears throat> so geez, uh, our next reader from our cohort will be Paula. Please give up for Paula. <laughs> This is called The Burning. I'm playing with matches, lighting them up, watching them flame, and blowing them out. A suspenseful game. I wait until the very last moment before the flame reaches the tip of my fingers and then blow it out. There's a superstition in Korea that if you played with fire, you would wet your bed at night. I'm not afraid of that. (laughs) At nine years old... I know how to control my bladder in my sleep. I am fascinated with the flame. It echoes the fire I feel inside of me. Sitting in the study, on the floor against the white wall lined with books behind the mahogany desk, I am not really hiding from anyone. I am just enjoying sitting alone in the dark and feeling the instantaneous warmth of the the lit up matches against my face and skin. I don't know how how many matches I lit before I give birth to this scar, but I know there's a pile of match carcasses on the floor. As I watch the last match light up, the burning ember falls into my lap, burning a hole in the middle of my right thigh. I don't scream or yelp or squirm. I watch the burning piece of wood sinking into my skin. I feel the burn sear through my body. It is painful and fascinating to watch and feel at the same time. The hot head of the match that sunk into my skin creates a pool of something murky that looks like melted opaque wax fluid. I wonder for a second, why am I seeing wax instead of blood? Through the heat and pain, I start to dig the wax-like fluid out of my fresh wound with the other end of the match. It feels like I'm digging wax out of my leg. I am simultaneously fascinated and disgusted by this action. Why am I doing this? Why am I not crying and shouting for help? Why am I sitting in agony and observing instead? What will my mother say when I show her my fresh wound? I remember when I scraped my face against a brick wall after I fell from a bike. My brother and I were riding our bikes down a hill, and my bike was rolling down so fast, I lost control of the brakes. I had two choices, to slam into a brick wall at the entrance of someone's home, or to go toward a banister on the edge of the hill that was clearly the cliff onto death. I chose the former. After I fell, I got up and did a body scan. No broken bones, just a couple scrapes on my knees and elbows. This was good. Great, even. When I faced my brother, he winced and looked like he was about to cry. He pointed at my face and voiced a sound that was a half yelp and half mutter. Look! I slowly turned around to look in the fisheye mirror for cars that was right next to the brick wall. What I saw was a girl with half of her face covered in blood. My first thought was, gross. Then the pain caught up with me. I started to cry because I wasn't sure how big the wound was. Was it the entire right half of my face? We scurried home, climbing up the seemingly endless gigantic hill with our bikes to reach a place of comfort. But no adult was there to treat and take care of my bloody face. So my brother and I knocked on the door of our neighbor's house. A a Caucasian husband and a Korean wife. We didn't know them very well, or at all actually. But they welcomed us into their dark and cavernous home. The lady gently cleaned up my face with warm water and rubbing alcohol and comforted me until I stopped crying and became calm. When it got dark, my brother and I returned to our house. I lay in my bed until my mom heard the news of my injury and came rushing into my room. I could hear her in the hallway asking my brother if I was okay. I was prepared for her and made the most pitiful face I could muster. (laughs) 
She took one look at my face and said, That's it? I felt betrayed. She seemed more concerned with the wound leaving a permanent mark on my face rather than feeling for my sorry state. Fortunately, the wound healed and did not leave a mark on my face. But my, my insides know how I felt when I didn't receive the sympathy and support I craved. As a nine-year-old with a burnt leg, I knew that even if I cried for help, people, being my mother, would not care. And since this scar wasn't on my face but on my leg that is easily concealable, the cry for help wouldn't be, would be even more futile. She was concerned about the scar marring my face, which would possibly get in the way of my future rather than how I was hurting. She is not a, she's not a bad mother or person. She is merely the practical kind, which is not to say she's uncaring. She cares deeply about where in the future the scar will lead me. A scar on my leg is much less liability than a scar on my face. So I stayed silent, stifling the loudness of the pain coursing through my body. Thank you. Next up to the mic, please welcome up Vita. Give up for Vita. So what I'm about to read is a very short piece. And during the summer, um, I learned while taking the poetry class from Bryn about this technique called blackout poetry, um, which is literally like the crossing off of like words. Um, and it's a way of saying that the absence of something like speaks, sometimes speaks more than like the presence of something. Um, so the piece is untitled. Um, okay. No one ever asks what tastes like. She only knows that it sits at the width of her tongue, dry, hollow, and all-consuming between that odd hour when the sky can't decide to let go of the night. When Ma tries to shush her, unsure what would make her fever dreams go away, cooks her a bowl of oatmeal. That is how comfort first feels to her, Warm, sweet, and soft down her throat, her head resting at the crook of Ma's arms. Later, she wouldn't know that meant erasure. She remembers the frills from the dress Ma made her sprawled across his legs, the foreign yet warm feeling that came from beyond the layers of fabric beneath her. She didn't know... Rung throughout those moments, even when the babble from Saturday morning cartoons filled the room. It was not until years later, while reading I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings, that she understood all too well why Maya screamed. Images of their legs dug out before them, flooded in and out of memory. Her words prescribed meaning to those Saturday mornings, like subtitles to a film. She wouldn't know what to say to Maya, but believes they each know that thank you can't be one of them. Eat a cookie and just keep reading, her teacher said. This would be years before the words trigger warning populated college campuses and the internet. She likes to believe trigger warnings can undo her, but she can't kid herself to believe that the potency of her memories will become any less apparent or that her mind will be any more ready than it already is to receive this world's violent messages. Because memory lives on the side of their skin, porous to the elements. And so she scrubs herself again and again until her flesh burns red. Thank you. You're listening to Apex Express on KPFA 94.1 FM, kpfa.org online. And we're going to continue listening to a recording of the final reading of Kearney Street Workshop's Interdisciplinary Writers Lab, a multi-genre master class for local writers. Please give it up for our next reader, Hope. My piece is entitled the time to move on. It's important to know what time it is. With her eyes closed, Viva thought the rain sounded like music. 
and not just any music, the kind that told her to stay in bed, not to get up and minister to the world, to stay and get some rest. That was probably good advice, but there was no time for that now. She was the keeper of stories for her people. Pillage, plunder, and pipelines morphed into shell mounds, rainforests, and animal spirits, at least in her dreams. In real life, the artists, poets, and storytellers were being disappeared so that sainthood could be conferred on war criminals. But all is as it is, and it's time to move on. As Viva began the final descent back into her earthly form, she felt the familiar hum and flow, the blood and bone. She caught up with her breath, drawn it in like a rosary to infinity as she eased into the mo- moment of her once vibrant body, now charred and broken. Why it still conjured her was a mystery. The pain was a hot white scream, a machete to the heart, her belly a wormhole to the next place. Through her dampened oral cavities, she could hear the screech of ravens, the moan of trees, the roar of mountains, as first contact appeared to repeat itself, unrelenting in its mission to destroy every Indian alive. She felt the prayers on bird's wings fluttering around her, ready for her final words, her last story. None came. Don't they know that words don't matter when hearts splinter into a million pieces? Or is that when stories are needed most? Overhead, the sun and moon locked in an embrace that welcomed forever. She was free now. Freer than her people could ever be. Freer than the ancestors of all nations promised to and embedded in the scorched, beaten earth. Viva, like her earth mother, was done. The time for second chances went up like prairie fire along with all the women, children, and elders around the world, and the warriors who perished protecting them. The end had begun with the massacre of the dreamers, the slaughter of innocents, followed by the mass extinction as the earth reclaimed her power, reclaimed her right to exist. Something made Viva look toward the east, and then she saw her, the one who scatters stars along the Milky Way. This made her smile. Perhaps there was time for one more story after all. Thank you. All right. The next instructor I would like to bring up is Bryn Saito. So, Bryn Saito is the author of The Palace of Contemplating Departure, winner of the Benjamin Sultan Poetry Award, and finalist for the 2013 Northern California Book Award. She also co-authored with Tracy Brimhall, Bright Power, Dark Peace, a chapbook of poetry from Diode Editions. Bryn's work has been anthologized by Helen Vendler and Ishmael Reed. It has also appeared in Poetry Northwest, Virginia Quarterly, Ninth Letter, Hayden's Fair Review, and Pleiades. Currently, Bryn lives and teaches in the San Francisco Bay Area, including at CIIS and her second book of poems will be published in the spring of 2016 by Red Hand Press so please give it up for Bryn so one night I had a dream that um, I was teaching and one of my students I used the word eminence and when I was teaching and one of my students was like, oh, what does imminence mean? And I was like, oh, I think it, in the dream, I literally said something like, oh, it's when something is sacred and equal at the same time. Um, and then I woke up and I was like, wow, I'm really smart in my dreams. <laughs> and, then, like, <laughs> and then, like about three weeks ago, I was teaching here at CIS. I teach in the BAC program and my students are here tonight joining us. And um, I think it was Flavia, right? We were sitting in the circle and Flavia was like, um, what does imminence mean? <laughs> and then I was able to like conjure that. Um, but before I actually used it in the classroom, I used that line in a poem and I'm going to read that poem. Um, but I want to say, that yeah teaching is a powerful thing and if you're one of my students I'm gonna like dream about you and then (laughs) write about you in my poems Um, but teaching with IWL was just like so transformative I think for all the reasons that um, have been spoken of already it was just this you know we talk about 
brave spaces over safe spaces. Like there are no safe spaces, right? And um, you could just be your bravest, most vulnerable, most compassionate self, you know, in the space. And and we were able to do that, I think, together and write together in that space. And it changed us all. So honor, just an honor to, to be a part of it and an honor to be here tonight, to hear everyone read just feels like, I mean, we, a year and a half ago, we were dreaming this up and it's actually happening. So, so this is called um, Present in All Things. In New York, summer sank into us like a hot tire and winters cut deep so we'd walk arm in arm for a cup of warmth, our faces wrapped in snow. Now I live in a seasonless city and I don't know where I am or how or what month. My grandmother who's dead is telling me stories and my sister saying I'm going to die young. And last night I yelled at a cop in West Oakland while his partner looked on my tremulous rage spiking the air around us with burnt cinnamon. What I mean to say is I'm living. What I mean to say is sometimes I can taste my own madness and I don't mind it and I miss you and I'm alive. When explaining imminence to my students, I say imminence means everything is both sacred and equal at the same time. Do you know how revolutionary this is? History teaches us otherwise. History has taught you to tie a black ribbon tight around your throat and try singing and to do this every morning and call it good. Do you remember the tipping hill town we passed on our drive to the coast? The one with the dusk light cut from a vein and the warm bread at midnight and a dependable landline, but no hot water and no spare devices for cooling. In my dreams, we arrive there and we park the car forever. Then we sit like two children at the top of a stopped Ferris wheel and we tell each other everything. Thank you. You're listening to Apex Express. KPFA 94.1 FM, kpfa.org online. And here's more from the final reading of this year's Interdisciplinary Writers Lab, a multi-genre masterclass for local writers put on by the Kearney Street Workshop and CIIS. All right, so we have three more readers from the cohort. So, first first of the last three to come up, please welcome up Janine. Give it up for Janine. After a long-distance phone call in which you did not know my voice. I remember sharing your bed during those warm nights when I'd visit. I'd listen for the low hum of your breath, mingling with the cricket orchestra and the percussion of rehearsal explosives just over the hill. Your breath was my comfort, a reminder that life goes on, even in a place where it so often didn't. You don't sleep much these days. Your breath comes jagged. You spend nights stumbling through rooms, pounding on doors and shouting like an occupying soldier. You no longer recognize your house. You tell everyone you want to go home. I wish I could take you back to the time before life cheated you, before the myriad health issues that plagued you like wild gin until your body and mind gave in. I wish I could lay your old life before you like a huge mound of dough, ready for you to knead into place and bake into one of your perfect loaves. When will I lie next to you again? Listen to your breath compete with the Moisin's call. Feel your body rise and fall next to me like the, like the dough, like it always has, even when we were apart. Now it's the past that occupies your bed, keeping you up all hours, taking from you what it always knew it would. Thank you. Moving on to our last two readers of the night. Uh, Please give it up for Fong. Um, I want to read a poem, or I want to read two poems. Um, But the first is a cover poem after Suhair Hamad's poem, No Cover Up. It starts with a quote from Bessie Head, an activist. 
It is myself and myself alone that I have to present. A protest is an excuse, a cover-up. No cover-up. No cover-up. This is us, the brown, skin, the flat, nose is strong, legs and night sky, hair thundering. No was not regimes and CIA plots and U.S. escalation. No was not guerrilla fighters hiding underground, undercover villages. No cover-up. This is us, the mother humming lullaby to baby in hammock, the father biking sit low for living. No cover-up. This is us, the yelling too loud, the pushing in markets, the squatting to make a seat where they forgot to set one. No cover-up. This is us, the child knows no history, tugged across the Pacific, sad stories buried deeper than our dead. No cover-up. This is us, artists digging into that darkness while tradition teaches us to never overturn graves. I want to give up for our last reader of the night. Uh, please give up for Josh. <laughs> Jay and the Mack Truck Boy or Black Boy as the Wind. He asks if I'm feminine at all. Right before he gags me, bitch foaming the corners of his lips, splattering my face. And I suppose he doesn't need permission for this, what, <laughs> with his big hands larger than my mouth, his body a Mack truck and me a breeze passing through, making a highway a home, mistook eight inches for a wind chime, figured I'd make some music. Silence is a hollow song, the way it implies an action like most songs, there is history behind this music. My silence derives from man, the way they take. My silence derives from white, the way you attach it to man. And the question is already implied, already answered, already pulled from my body and assumed inheritance, assumed position, and filled when the Mack truck boy asked if I was feminine at all, he was asking, do you know what happens to the wind here on this highway? Are you the wind? May I break through you? I promise there'll be enough of you left for the rest of us speeding by. And I suppose his thank you is as implied as his yes, what, with his big hands Larger than my mouth, the size of February, the size of my death in a newspaper, a Facebook post, a white boy's bed. As a child, I'd boast loudly about being a typhoon in the face of danger. I suppose this is why the Mack truck boy smiled when he smiled, his grin the irony stretching across my skin. Before we parted, he wanted me to call him daddy. As a child, I was told not to run from beatings. That'll only make matters worse. Thanks. <laughs> Selected readings from this year's Interdisciplinary Writers Lab, put on by Kearney Street Workshop and CIIS. They'll be taking new applicants next year, so to find out more about IWL, check out kearneystreet.org. Thanks to Justine Lee for editing the segment. To subscribe to our podcast or listen to our archives, hit up our website, apexexpress.org. You can also find us on Facebook. Apex Express is produced by Marie Che, Alan Choi, Tara Jarabji, Salima Hamarani, Rosalia Lano, Carl Jogbungan Singh, RJ Lozada, Preeti Mangala Shekhar, Robin Takayama, Yvonne Tran, and Michael Yoshida. Thanks to Justine Lee for editing the bulk of tonight's show. I've been your host, No No Girl. Up next is the Bonnie Simmons Show.